Salam alaikum, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be here and to see such a prominent group of people, excellencies, uh, dear guests. Um, my name is Cornelius Mattes. I've been based in the UAE for the last a uh, little bit more than 10 years. Uh, I'm running a think tank called DRI Desert Energy. We cover all emission-free technologies. Um, working with 120 partners from 35 countries, including many of the prominent French companies. And it's been just amazing to see the past few years how the region has established itself as one of the global centers of the world, particularly the UAE um, on energy transition. This has gone from marketing to some of the largest solar projects in the world and on how the region has diversified. I'm going regularly to Saudi, we work with Naom. It's just breathtaking to see what really the region has come from power point to power plant. And it's becoming not only in energy transition, but in many sectors actually the center of the world. So in this sense, I think we have a lot of concrete things to discuss. We are in the middle of a very dynamic development. We can discuss I think amazing achievements in countries like Saudi Arabia, where we are half to vision 2030. And I'm delighted uh, to be here to, to have the honor to moderate such an esteemed uh, panel. So to, to kick off, maybe just a very brief presentation of uh, everybody, your role, um, your organization, and if you would like, just a brief statement on how you see the development. Let's maybe start just here. Good morning, uh, everyone. It's an impressive audience. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Bruno Bonnel. I'm in charge of uh, France 2030, uh, which is a, a 54 billion uh, euros allocation dedicated to innovation in France in many, many different fields. I'll have the opportunity to come back on this. But uh, innovation understood as solutions uh, to all the complex answers that our world is facing today. Um, innovation in AI, in quantum technologies, in space, deep sea exploration, um, and so on and so forth. But more importantly, innovation as well in education and training of people, because behind the dollars, behind the euros, behind all the money that we can put for the future, the critical, import, the critical point will be to have the, the women and the men able to really uh, have the skills to build it. That's what I would say first. I'll come back to this. Thank you, Bruno. Good morning, Suleiman. So my name is Suleiman Mazrou. I work for uh, Vision 2030. Uh, and when we were talking uh, with the team on the private room, we were, I just, remembered when I first talked about Vision 2030, it was in 2017. And when we uh, were discussing with our international partners about that, how ambitious is our uh, programs to achieve 2030, you know, I, I still remember their vital expression of, uh, yeah, 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 that's, that's kind of a good dream. But today, you know, I'm I'm so happy that, you know, Vision 2030 is across the corner, it's less than five years now, and we achieved most of the numbers that we thought that we will be achieving in 2013 now, in 2024, and uh, even before that. Uh, our aim uh, as part of NIDL program is to transform the kingdom to a pioneer industrial power and a global logistic hub. That's our main uh, purpose, uh, we uh, would like to amplify the power and the resources we have from mining, oil and gas, uh, to actually diversify our economy out of oil. That's that's the whole premises that we have in, in the program. So far, we have a lot of achievements happening, whether it's a GDP growth, uh, export uh, has been tripled, uh, non-oil non -oil exports. The, investments uh, in a uh, program uh, exceeded 500 billion Saudi Arabia. That's almost 150 billion uh, euro just in the past five years. 
um, I'll be so happy to uh, to discuss this with uh, with uh, with the team during the panel. But it's it's a true pleasure for me uh, to be among our French partners. Uh, just for the past two years, we work with uh, France uh, Business France and France 2030 to have more than 20 engagements, 20 engagement of business communities between Saudi and France, whether in in Riyadh or in uh, Paris. So I'm so happy that uh, this is happening and remarkable results so far, whether in large companies, Airbus and Altos and others, or SMEs or even entrepreneurs. We have we have four entrepreneurs, or four young friends, France uh, entrepreneurs actually in Riyadh now uh, doing a business pilot with some of the companies in Saudi. So it's it has been remarkable the two years of engagement with Business France. I am so happy to be with you. Well done, it's great to have ambitious targets and to even overachieve them. Congratulations, uh, Safa, good morning. Um, good morning and bonjour, um, Monsieur Cornelius. Je parle français un petit peu, so I'm going to stick to English. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, I have to say that I'm extremely privileged to be sharing the stage with, you know, um, a lot of voices of wisdom around me today. And I'm sure that each one of you have been um, architects to a lot of development agendas that we see in the region today. So one more time, um, your Excellencies, my, uh, the participants, and Mr. Cornelius, thank you so much, sir, for moderating this event. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, just one thing I wanted to add that um, our amazing host just asked the audience of how many of you have been to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Al Ula, the amazing Al Ula, but she didn't ask how many of you have been to the Kingdom of Bahrain. So how many of you have been to the Kingdom of Bahrain so far? So <laughs> basically, wow, I'm so impressed. Actually, the Kingdom of Bahrain, um, is, it's, it's a small island. Island, um, and you're talking about a population of just 1.5 million, but trust me, we are very big and we are very aggressive when it comes to our development and growth plans. And we have a lot to offer and I'm very happy to be speaking about what we have to offer. We are not only business friendly, we are people friendly as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for actually giving us the chance to speak about what we have to offer in Bahrain and all the achievements. I represent an entity, um, uh, it's a government entity that supports, nurture, and accelerates the growth of both product and service exports. And we've supported a lot of businesses to actually access global markets and opportunities. Will you allow me later, Mr. Cornelius, to talk about it? Because if I started speaking, I'm not going to stop. So I will, I will actually <laughs> give the mic. Well done, Safa. Now, Bahrain is like a small, laid-back Dubai, and I'm always really enjoying to come to Bahrain. It's, it's wonderful people, as you said. So you made a, a, a perfect presentation, I think, of, of your country. Uh, Marc, bonjour. And, and bonjour. And if it were me, I would let you speak for, for the rest of an hour and 37 minutes. Um, good morning. Bonjour, everyone. I'm Marc Lermit. I'm, I'm, I come from another business-friendly organization, um, and, uh, which is called EY, 400,000 people. We're in the a professional services industry. We're not only advisors, consultants, uh, professionals in the audit and, and legal and tax business, but we're also in, in an industry. I think I want to stress today that we're also employers of choice in, uh, in the region, in various regions. I run our uh, global team advising our key clients on location uh, uh, decisions. So how to make complex location decisions in a very complex world um, so we have uh, we select about a hundred projects a year where we uh, dedicate uh, most of our global resources in making the right choices so you you can count on the, the probably the more massive investments and I run also our government advisory business on economic development visions 2030 so uh, very honored I want to thank business France for inviting me and and us and looking forward to the panel thank you Cornelius wonderful thank you so much uh, Sharif, good morning. Well, uh, merci bien pour l'opportunité aujourd'hui. Um, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for having us today. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, I see the competition, you know, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and uh, EY and PwC on the panel, which will make it, uh, you know, very hot discussion for, for the panel. Um, uh, I'm really glad uh, to see this, uh, uh, the uh, Vision Golf, um, to have the 
relationship between the business and, and, and um, the opportunities that are really arising in the Middle East. Um, I lead the clients and markets for PricewaterhouseCoopers in, in the Middle East for the 12 countries. And I really see the momentum of the projects, the infrastructure, the artificial intelligence. We have touched base on Alaula. We are seeing Neom. We are seeing the infrastructure, the Silk Road, the Northern Islands. Uh, this is the, 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 the area, or that is the, the plan, uh, where all the opportunities are arising up. We are witnessing lots of developments, um, unwitnessed growth rates in, in these markets between Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, and, and, and all the Gulf region, to be honest. And that is happening in all the sectors. Uh, very happy and very delighted to discuss how this uh, happened. We are seeing many of the French companies as well coming to the region uh, in different sectors. We are seeing Gustave Roussy, we are seeing um, Airbus, we are seeing all of the, the, the European and the French companies are really doing and collaborating in this infrastructure, new technology, green technology, and it is really happening. So very happy to be with you today and uh, very happy to take this competition through the panel. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh... Well, I, I'd love to start with uh, Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Well, I've been regularly uh, traveling over the last 10 years, but obviously since Vision 2030 started in 2017, this has been a massive change. I'm myself going personally quite often to Neom as well, and apart from the natural beauty, which is really breathtaking, it's, uh, it's a unique environment where you go to the camp and you see uh, thousands of people motivated, it's a unique atmosphere, it's building something unique in the world, it's building something new, and this is happening. You know, we see it on the energy side. Naom is, for example, leading the world's largest green hydrogen project powered entirely by solar and wind energy. So this is happening. It's an $8.4 billion investment, and it's being executed. It attracted uh, $6.1 billion dollars um, non-recourse project finance by 23 banks. So this is just one example. Go to Octagon, that's an industrial city where um, hundreds of expressions of interest from all around the world on producing, on manufacturing in some of the strategic future sectors from renewable energy to smart mobility, water, so on and so forth. So, um, well, just, uh, just a few um, points from my side, and of course, also how Riyadh has been changing. It's, it, it, it's really amazing. It's uh, the place to be. That's, uh, that's how I see it. So, um, Suleiman, would you like to, um, to elaborate a little bit, um, not only on energy sector, maybe a bit in general, on the achievements uh, of Vision 2030 halfway through now from, from 2017. I think it's uh, more or less 50%. And um, I think as we saw, Saudi Arabia has been really kind of over delivering even, which is impressive. Sure. Uh, if I want to start that, what's the success factor of Vision 2030 in Saudi that made things happening as fast as it's happening now? I think the first one is the leadership. You know, His Excellency, the, the Crown Prince, is amazingly driving this clear vision to everyone. And from that, we get everyone excited to, to participate. I came from private sector. I never thought I would work for the government. You know, that was never in my career path choices. But with Vision 2030, that's become you know, the purpose that I want to achieve in my life. So that's not me. That's almost every Saudi now uh, and everyone who's living in Saudi. Uh, the second success factor that I think it's amazingly uh, um, you know, contributing, that's this vision is not a government vision. It's everyone vision. And even international participant. We have seen a lot of international partners believe as much as we believe in this vision and come with us on this. And the reason of that, I think, because it's true, it's a Saudi vision, but it's contribute mainly to the international challenges. You know, energy transition and sustainability, it's at heart of Vision 2030. Developing the humanity is at heart of uh, Vision 2030. Contribute to the global supply chain is at heart of Vision 2030. And I'm sure you have seen this in every board today. If there is three trends 
that's been repeated in every conference, in every board member, is the three things. Sustainability, supply chain, and digital and AI. And in 2017, that was, if, if anyone has chance to read uh, Vision 2030 documents that's online available, you will see the three trends at the heart of Vision 2030. That's why everyone uh, from our international partners think that it's contribute to their KPIs, to their target, to their purpose too. From energy, let's start with energy. Saudi Arabia has the highest target on the world when it comes to renewables, 50% from Saudi energy mix will come from renewables in 2030. This is not 2040, this is not 2050. If you, if you check the European targets, no one is even getting to 30% to by 2030. We are uh, targeting 50% from uh, uh, renewable energy by 2030. And today we have already achieved three gigawatts from renewables, and 13 gigawatts is under development right now. So we are close to, to achieving even more than 50%, and His Royal Highness, the Minister of Energy, said that we will be exporting renewables to the rest of the Middle East. So that's, that's even an extended target to what we had. We are the only one in the world who building this dream city that's zero carbon, zero waste. I don't think that's ever exists in anyone's dream that we will have a full city that built from green uh, with zero carbon and zero uh, waste. We have the largest green hydrogen factories on the world. We are the only one who actually walk the walk and talk the talk when it's come to moving to green hydrogen. And this will be exporting to the whole world anyone who is looking for premium green hydrogen resources. We have the Saudi Green, which is the most ambitious uh, turning that desert that we have seen in the pictures to a green. And we are using the most advanced technology to be preserved to water and using air as a water for, for planting these greens. And on and on, it's come to, uh, you know, the Saudi Arabia been leading in oil and gas business, and they have determined that they should be playing the same role of leading on uh, all the new renewable mixes, looking after the all needs, least developing countries, developing country, and most developed countries, and to be part of that journey for all of them. Uh, Moving from energy to uh, manufacturing, for the past 40 years, uh, since the first factory in Saudi until 2016, we had 7,000 factories. That's a great uh, achievement, but just in the few years of Vision 2030, the six, seven years, we have 11,800 11, factories. That's 60% of we, what we have achieved on the 40 years, just in six years. Our exports doubled. Uh, just the non bitkim the whole non-oil is troubled. Uh, our uh, mix of, of factories, we have now the automotive uh, cluster on the west of the country. We have Lucid, Hyundai, uh, Seer, and others are going to be announced very soon. So a full automotive cluster is, uh, EV cluster is built on the west of the country right now, and Lucid already started a production. In the east of the country, we have the shipbuilding and maritime industries, and that's, I think if I, I've gone, if, 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 if I continue telling all the uh, achievements on, 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 on Vision 2030, it'll take me hours, but uh, I, I would like to single out one important aspect that even my wife keep, keep reminding me that's uh, the women empowerment. Uh, we had you know, a massive change in, in Saudi when it's come to the women empowerment. So we, had, we had a target of 2030 to have 30% of our uh, labor coming from uh, women. And today, 
we have 32%. So we already exceeded 2030, mar 2030 targets when it comes to women empowerment. Uh, and that's not just on the labor force. We have them the leadership. We have them in, in every aspect of our lives. We have seen that there is an you know, unleashed uh, talents that's becoming uh, helping us achieving 2030 even faster. I don't want to take uh, longer, but the, you know the discussion will take hours if I keep. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suleiman. I think the message is that uh, really things are happening, and I can only confirm. I already mentioned about Neom renewable energy. This is just impressive because it's uh, the world's lowest cost. You have one cent solar. One to one and a half cents, you have uh, one and a half. The latest uh, uh, long term power purchase agreement on wind was just a uh, few weeks back with Maramani, 1.6 cents, 1.6 dollar cents per kilowatt hour for wind energy for long term power purchase agreement. So this is just amazing. In Neom, there is actually even uh, a great complementary. Uh, complementarity between solar and wind. So when the sun goes down towards the evening, the wind starts. It's these fall winds coming from the mountains. So this is why you have a unique condition of joint renewable generation, solar and wind, and you can achieve such a, a high capacity factor, such a high percentage of utilization of the electrolyzer to produce green hydrogen, you know, which makes uh, Neom Green Hydrogen not only by far the largest project, but uh, a unique project in, in many aspects. Um, well, let's ask maybe um, Bruno. We work with many French companies. I know that EDF, um, our partner, they're quite involved in, in Saudi with Mazda in the first wind park. Uh, NG ha has a big presence there, but many other French companies actually, not only in energy from, from Total, of course, but uh, uh, Schneider Electric is quite involved in, in Saudi. Would you like to give us this perspective a bit more on, from a French side, French um, uh, Vision 2030 and uh, involvement? How do you see the involvement of French companies in the region, in the GCC region? Yes, of course. But if you allow me, I'd like just to, uh, to take a little bit of a step back, just to explain um, what is happening really in the world. We see many, many countries now talking about vision for 2030, if not 2050. And you have two ways to look at it. One way is, uh, I would say, the anxious way, where people feel like there is a big threat on our planet and we need to react. And we're in kind of defensive mode. And we, we try to find solutions, very often in emergencies, trying just to put patches on situations that have lasted for too long, uh, including, of course, you know, global warming and, and, and uh, in France specifically, for instance, disindustrialization. But there is a much better way to look at it, which is that the world is really going into a new step. We had a long, long time ago a first step where uh, people discovered tools, right? And these tools allowed us to improve our dexterity and build some, some object and stuff. Many, many years after this, we had a second step that now is called industrial revolution, where uh, the oil energy and the coal energy were able to really uh, reinforce our strengths with the machines. And thanks to those machines, including the planes, including the cars, including everything, we're able to build a new civilization. And now comes a new step where really people are understanding the power of electricity and they have the will of have green electricity. And I call this, maybe in the future books, they'll keep this word, but I'll call this the green revolution. Why? Because in fact, what's happening is electricity is an energy of power, of course, but is an energy of intelligence as well, thanks to digital and AI. So that's what we're living now. That's why every single country is trying to figure out how they're going to reorganize themselves for the future. And it implies many, many facts, like a reorganization of the global economy around the planet. And if we collaborate so well with the Gulf, it's because this positive attitude to change, this positive attitude to vision, uh, when we see that you know, the daring project that we been described today, the NEOM and the ALULA and all this, when we see this positive attitude toward the future, it builds trust and it builds new relationship. And my, during my visit to the kingdom uh, last two months or three months ago, I don't remember, 
I saw this energy, and I think that's why France and the kingdom has such a good connection. Because we don't see France 2030 as a desperate measure to save the world. We don't see it as, oh, okay, you know, as we're all going to die, let's try something. We do exactly the opposite. We give hope, energy, trust, and we build new bridges. And that's why I'm really encouraging the French companies to really look at what's going on there. Because we believe we do big. Oh, come on, when you see what they're doing, it was trying with them to build it. And it will be new models with new tries. And that's why with France 2030, what we do, we, we give means to the French company to really go into those places, discuss with partners, establish possibly you know, subsidiaries or structure there to really show that the French innovation is participating to this positive new vision of 2030. I think that was a very powerful statement. And I think the, the trust, the connections between the people, the positive vibe, this is the real energy, by the way, you mentioned about electrons and how the electrons, you know, they're becoming uh, smart. Um, they're even connecting with the molecules. So with hydrogen, basically, we cover not only the 20, 30 percent of the power sector, but we cover heating, cooling, mobility, many other things. So in this sense, you know, uh, electricity, and gas, and more importantly, hydrogen markets, they're all merging and providing unique new possibilities. So I think that's a, that's a very interesting development as well, presenting many opportunities for us. Safa, I really like your enthusiastic start on, uh, on Bahrain. Would you like to uh, explain us a bit more in detail on the achievements? So I know Bahrain is a major financial center. Um, FinTech, I think, is, is an important one, but um, I'm always uh, surprised. Every time I come to Bahrain, I'm learning new things. It's, uh, well, it's um, home to some of the large investment companies like InvestCorp, but uh, there's so many things going on. Could you maybe um, uh, give us a, a few more concrete examples? I'd love to learn more about Bahrain. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mr. Cornelius. And yes, I'll try my best to convince all of you to come to Bahrain, as you rightly mentioned, Mr. Bruno. But I just have a small comment on the competition side when you mentioned, I don't think we compete with each, with each other. I think we are complementing each other. And, and I, 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 was, I was just mentioning to His Excellency, you know, uh, uh, behind the screens a while back that I think in the last 20 years, there has been a lot of integration, um, you know, in the GCC. And this integration has been, you know, um, is and has been really extremely important and has actually you know supported a lot of um, you know a, a, a lot of positivity in our economies as a matter of fact if you notice that there has been at the, i mean at the end of the day we are just one piece of the puzzle in the grand scheme of things and if you notice this because of this integration we have you know the the combined gdp has actually multiplied the um, you know the the external trade with you know and it, with with uh, international with the world has actually multiplied. Um, the interregional trade has actually increased. So, so I think this would not have been possible if there was no, if we were, you know, um, 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 uh, if we were working. Uh, without this integration and and as you said i mean in every you know in every session and every panel and every meeting and every engagement we are talking about the non oil economy right so i think this is where the future is this is where the growth is today you know 83% of our economy is actually non oil so there is a lot of opportunities and if you allow me we have a very interesting story as to you know how we were formed as export bahrain and what do, how do we support companies who are willing to invest in Bahrain. So we initially, in, in, in 2016, um, His Royal Highness, our Prime Minister, and our Crown Prince, because the economy is small, uh, so what happened is because we have, you're talking about 80,000 active commercial registrations, right? So, and we have a lot of entities that support the medium and small, um, uh, small medium enterprises. So to avoid that fragmentation and duplication of activities, the government formed something called as a small medium development board 
board, which is chaired by the Minister of uh, Industry and Commerce. So, and, and the main task of that board, which is basically includes, um, you know, the board members are key stakeholders in the country who look into what are, you know, what are the gaps and what are the opportunities and how we can actually support the small medium enterprises. And I'm saying the MSMEs in specific because they are the pillars of our economy. And this is something that, you know, I think is a universal fact. And, and the larger enterprises have their own sort of infrastructure, have their own sort of networks and connections. So they don't really require that support as much as the MSMEs. So uh, one of the, of the outcome of this board was that we do not have a specific entity, a dedicated entity that supports the MSMEs to diversify their market. So it was always like, oh, okay, so my biggest market is, is, is within the GCC itself. However, we made them realize that sky is their limit. And to be honest, during COVID, it was a blessing in disguise for us. So when the world changes, we, you know, the government of Bahrain looked at how could we utilize, you know, these opportunities and turn it to something that could benefit our businesses. And this is where in, we were officially formed as an initiative. So we, we, we first started as an idea on paper, and then we started as an initiative that was incubated by another entity in Bahrain to support, to nurture, and accelerate the growth of both products and service exports that's going out from Bahrain. Um, um, Within one year, we actually, uh, we were successful in overachieving our target that was set by His Royal Highness, the Prime Minister. And so then we got our independence, and so we became a private entity, you know, uh, owned 100% by the government. And what do we do? Um, we offer very interesting and, and, and very popular sort of packages to support the diversification of our businesses. One, um, we act as facilitators mostly, so we, partner, we have forged so far, we are five years in the market. We are just five years in the market and it's a matter of pride that we will be very soon, um, um, you know, facilitating, closing the facilitation of $1 billion worth of exports within five years for the MSMEs only. So we, we support our businesses when it comes to export credit insurance. So our businesses, um, uh, you know, are very uh, comfortable when they want to deal with an international partner where they are guaranteed 90% of the payback and during the COVID actually they were you know they were given back 100% payback so there is no risk when they come to um, you know explore um, uh, uh, explore a new market uh, we do we have partners with the shipping and logistics agencies the smaller ones and the bigger ones uh, where a business coming through export Bahrain will actually be provided with 60 to 80 percent below market price for their shipping prices right and this was was very popular during uh, COVID times. And, and we provide options for air, land, and sea as well. Um, we also are partners with the International Trade Center uh, to provide market intelligence and up-to-date information to our businesses related to their sectors, to their subsectors. And in some of the areas, we actually tell our businesses, you know, these are your competitors, and your competitors are actually dealing with these businesses, and they're buying at that rate. So we provide that sort of very sensitive information to our uh, to our buyers to ensure that they're actually closing a deal in international markets. We support new players in the market, new exporters in the market by subsidizing up to 20% of their first export transaction. Um, we also have launched something called as a retail initiative, international initiative. Now, you, I don't know if it works similarly in France, but um, sometimes, uh, let's say for example, you have this local product, you see it uh, shelved in Carrefour in one branch, but you cannot see it in the other branches. And it is because the listing fee is very expensive for the micro small enterprises. It costs around ranging between, um, you're talking about 10 to 12,000 euros US dollars per branch. And we were talking about the MSMEs, which this could be really expensive. They can't afford it. So we came with a very innovative um, uh, you know, concept during Corona where we had this agreement with retail uh, retailers who have international branches. So we told them, you are going to, we actually did our market research to see um, you know, what are the products that's being imported. So we told them we can substitute those imports with, our, with the products that's made in Bahrain 
and we are not going to charge our businesses any fee. And we are not doing it for an indefinite period of time. We are doing it for a specific period of time so that the retailers can actually look into the demand for those products. And at the same time, the exporters will understand, OK, so my product is doing well in this area. Or I need to improve. You know, they get first-hand information on what needs to be improved. Number two, the retailers actually purchase those items, and they private label it and send it to their headquarters outside. As a matter of fact, we, we, we actually launched this program in 2020, uh, 2022, early 2022. So far, we sold and we shelved our local products and international markets worth almost 4 million US dollars in just two years' time. And I'm talking again about the medium, small enterprises. Um, um, in the last five years, we have, uh, we have accessed over 100 international markets for these small, medium enterprises. We had around 30% of businesses who never exported before. They're first-time exporters. We had around 35% who diversified their markets from just the GCC to accessing international and the Asian and the African markets. And let me tell you, Mr. Cornelius, that Export Bahrain is run by a team of only nine all-female team. You know, so, so uh, we are very proud of that. And I know that there's a long way, there's a long way. We, we, we continuously look into, you know, we engage with our businesses on a daily basis. We look into, as we launch our initiatives, we listen to the market. And when we listen, we enhance, we improve, we uh, launch new initiatives, and we continue to build more strategic partnerships, uh, more international strategic partnerships to ensure that we're providing the right avenues for our businesses. And this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, 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 I you know, wanted to tell you in detail because this is applicable to to any business, regardless of the ownership, as long as they are in Bahrain. That is impressive, uh, Safa. Well, even uh, an all-ladies uh, team, the Swiss leadership, congratulations, 83% non-oil. Who would have thought about Bahrain being one of the main, main uh, let's say, oil producers in the region? That's quite uh, impressive as well. And uh, really amazing to see that you even managed to attract a few uh, prominent organizations, like in my sector, for example, I know the global clean tech uh, business uh, club organization, which, uh, which is quite well known, has relocated the global headquarters to Bahrain. So Bahrain, I see always as a very interesting uh, test laboratory as well, because it's such a you know, small and efficient country. You can just come. I think uh, my experience as well, you, you get um, easy access to ministers, to decision makers. You have a dialogue, and you have really an openness. And you have uh, all institutional organizations that are very business friendly and supporting. And I think uh, Safa gave us many examples uh, on uh, how this is uh, done in concrete terms. So really uh, impressive. Uh, thank you so much for giving us uh, such a detailed flavor on all the concrete achievements and how you work. Uh, let's go to Kuwait. Uh, What's happening in Kuwait? So I've not been for the last two years. On the energy side, um, well, there have been a few initiatives. Uh, Kisre, we've been working with Kisre for many years, a research institute. But uh, yeah, I think progress has been somewhat uh, slower, at least that's my perception compared to the other GCC countries, right? Or can you maybe prove us uh, otherwise? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me give you some statistics um, uh, about Kuwait in specific. And um, since it is the vision Gulf or the vision of the Gulf, uh, Kuwait also has like um, uh, a very good vision in place, and uh, we are witnessing the, the development. And to your point about the, uh, the growth rate in Kuwait and uh, uh, the slow pace that is taking place, that is mainly because of the political uh, changes and the development of the political environment. Um, however, the vision for Kuwait, of, if, if you look at it um, by 2035, they need to achieve like uh, uh, if you can imagine on seven pillars, so they are looking actually for the development of um, the global positioning of the country among all the, the, the world countries. Um, they are looking for the human capital as well. So they are looking, for example, to have uh, like 40,000 student capacity in, in place and, and new colleges and, and new universities. And we are seeing the, the very uh, mega project of the, Kuwait, the new Kuwait universities that are opening in, in the country. Very huge, um, very good opportunity for, for uh, job opportunities and, and places for students. 
Um, on the healthcare, they, they are targeting to have like a capacity to bring all of the uh, multinationals and the healthcare sector to bring it to the country with a capacity of more than 8,000 beds available in Kuwait for hospitals and, and treatments and uh, new technology. Um, the, the, the living environment as well, uh, they are looking to diversify the economy by, by having like at least 15% from renewable energy and from the, 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 the new infrastructure project that should be uh, using this green technology and artificial intelligence. Um, on the infrastructure projects, they are looking as well for uh, above uh, two digits uh, gross, above the 10%, uh, to have like a new of, uh, kind of infrastructure uh, projects. Um, on the economy uh, itself, uh, there is uh, a plan to have uh, to open up for the small and the medium enterprises. And that statistics or the plan is to have it for more than 3,500 opportunities for a small and medium size opportunities for the private sector. Um, and if you look at the public administrations as well, uh, we are seeing now and we are witnessing now. So in, in the old days, you always see um, the fact that in order to do the business in a country like Kuwait, you need a sponsor. And, and that is now completely changing. And the duration for opening up a company now, they are trying to reduce it to be at least of two weeks to 20 days so that you can have a licensing and you can have a processing and you can work with ease. Um, they developed as well what we called Kadipa, the Kuwait Direct Investment Promotion Authority, whereas you can have 100% ownership of, of foreign entities to operate in the country. So if you look at the seven pillars between this, uh, the healthcare and between the energy sector and between the infrastructure, hospitality, human capital, sustainability, green technology, um, that, is, that is really uh, uh, the pace and that is really a momentum. And, and if we compare that, as I started at the beginning, uh, there is like kind of, if we, if we are seeing this happening in Bahrain, and I'm really glad that this is uh, uh, really developing in that sense, it is not only, by the way, so uh, as I started, the Gulf region is really getting the attraction. This is the momentum, and this is where everything is, is really happening. Now you can see many things are happening at many fronts, right? So global warming changing in the weather, and, um, and you're seeing as well uh, lots of actions coming from the government to, to undertake this and to deal with the situation and to really uh, diversify the economy and get you know, more of green technology and artificial intelligence. So that is happening globally. And if you look, if you, if you shed the focus on the Gulf region, you can see lots of regulatory changing as well happening. As I just mentioned, you know, in, in, in Kuwait, if you compare, you know, we have like a, a budgetary GDP by 190 billion US dollars annually, while the uh, expenditures, it goes to 220. So there is still a deficit, although it's a very rich country, and, and the diversity of the economy is the way to grow. So the regulatory changing are happening as well. So now you can see in Saudi Arabia, for example, if you have a headquartered company in Saudi Arabia, you get a 30 years of incentives and, and heavens, and you get like kind of lots of facilities to, to, to do the business. Uh, if you look at it for, for, from the, the, the UAE as well, the attraction of the business and the free zone companies and the um, uh, DFIC and alike, they are also meant to help and, and regulate the business in, in a different shape and form. We are seeing this is happening in Bahrain as well, as Safa mentioned, and in Kuwait, and you're seeing this is also happening on the regulatory changing. So if you compare all of uh, this together and you connect the dots, you will see the, the projects happening like Neom in Saudi Arabia, you will see Al Ola, you will see as well the Northern Island, the Silk Cities in Kuwait, you will see, you will see in Bahrain as well all of these projects that are coming up. Um, this is like a momentum where it needs a collaboration between um, all, and, and it's, it's now a matter of resources. And if you have the right resources in place and you, ha you have the right mindset and, and the strategy, then all of the developments will be happening in this region in a very uh, uh, good pace with lots of development and impact on the economy. The collaboration between the European, the European Union as well as the Gulf uh, nations and in Paris in specific, the, multi, the multinational companies and expertise who are uh, really devoted to help on this infrastructure project, healthcare, sustainability, green technology, artificial intelligence, I think if that all comes together, that will really reform and reshape the region overall.
Yeah, thank you for that. And it's a, it's really an interesting period, a very dynamic period in times of change. So there is a value added tax in the UAE for, for several years now. Uh, I understand this has been implemented uh, in different timelines, different forms uh, in the region. So there is VAT in Saudi now and in, uh, in other countries as well. And it's also interesting to see how just in a few years the patterns of setting up new companies has completely changed uh, in the free zones. I've personally set up companies in different Emirates from Ras Al Khaimah to Ajman to Dubai. And uh, it's really a, a quite a dramatic change now. There's a lot more competition. Um, it's much more business friendly, by the way. There's not only VAT, there's a corporate tax now. Uh, in the UAE, we are speaking about 9% above $100,000 uh, profit. And this is even valid for the free zones. So I think that's a, that's a thing. Which, uh, which is quite a dramatic change, but I think it is still, it is actually much better than zero because it is more credible from an international standard point. So it's a competitive tax rate, uh, it's not uh, an oasis by any means, and I think it, it creates more sustainable revenues, more diversified revenues for the country as well. So I think this is all uh, quite positive. Let's come to Mark. So, Ian, why? I know your, your colleagues from the attractiveness indices you've made for many years for the different countries for renewables, but you've worked with um, the countries as well on the different visions. So I think you, you must have a very good overview on the different uh, visions from 2030 or 2035, Kuwait, so on and so forth. So um, how, how effective are these visions and how do you maybe also manage to differentiate? Because many countries have visions, so how do you manage to stand out? Two very good questions. Um, uh, so we, as you, as you say, we, we work with hundreds of companies on how to accelerate and implement projects uh, across the two regions. Uh, when I talk about regions, the Gulf, but also Europe, because France is, cannot do it alone. So I'll try to answer those two questions. So the first question is on the efficiency of the Visions 2030. So basically, if we look at what they are and, and probably two different uh, angles uh, that the Visions 2030 um, here in Europe and also in, in the Gulf countries, they're either a very structured public investment plan helped and, and put together to accelerate private investment. I think Bruno will probably talk about it a little bit further. That's what France 2030 is. Uh, structured finance, uh, providing verticals that are very visible, and, and generally they do the job. And, and I'm not here to salute or to, to give positive remarks because I'll, I'll probably also tell you about some lessons learned and that are a little bit more difficult to, to, uh, to, to hear. Uh, the other angle is the diversification angle so that's what we see and uh, and and uh, diversification not only from uh, high carbon to low carbon economies but by diversification to uh, also apply new methods new postures new behaviors uh, within the, the population that that's what we've heard and I want to put the motion that the new energy is called SAFA today because I was so impressed by your energy SAFA so my motion is that SAFA is the name of the new energy today um, Interesting to note, uh, you probably have note, that there are 2030 visions, but there are 2031, 2035, even 2071. We don't have a representative from the UAE, but they have bold enough uh, not to be here today on the panel. I'm sure they are in the room, but also to propose a 2071 vision, which is very interesting. It's uh, certainly, again, the France 2030 plan is probably one of the more coherent. I, I heard Bruno saying we're not here to give lessons to the world. I think it's a very important message. Uh, nobody was believing uh, it before entering the room, but it's important to... Uh, to, uh, to uh, but it's no surprise, and we think we have seen through our research and, and observation, day-to-day -day observation, that France 2030 is probably one of the main reasons why uh, the country has captured, retained, and it's a very high competition, the first place for foreign inward investment in Europe in the past five years. Um, that's what our report says, uh, independent from the government. Uh, and, and we believe, along with structural reforms that are very important, there were tax reforms to do, there are still more to be done. Uh, there were labor market reforms to be done in France, they were done and, and they provide a vision. But the France 2030 provides the structure, uh, the reassurance and the stability which uh, investors crave probably more in Europe than in, anywhere else uh, in, in the world. If I go to the um, other part of the equation, to the, the Gulf country and try to accelerate, I think uh, 
what those plans uh, raise is also the, uh, the way they can make a difference. You asked the questions, Cornelius, how do they differentiate? Because it's a fierce competition between countries. Of course, we're all friends, and we heard you, Safa, say we're not here to, complete, to compete, but to complement. Uh, we, we hear that, but I also see, and our team see, so many representatives from so many countries coming to our doors, to our clients' doors, and, and, and giving an extremely compelling narrative. So how do you make a difference? The way we saw uh, a difference I want to propose, again, because they're not on the panel, is the way the uh, UAE tries to deploy uh, through the youth councils, where we are very involved, EY is very involved in the youth council in a very practical way, trying to, let's say, give a playbook, a manual uh, to the young community within our company, with our, within our clients' ecosystems, because we see that probably is one of the weak links, how to engage the population at large and the younger generation in Visions 2030 that can be appear very corporate, very structured, very long-term for what they, what they are. I, if you allow me, Cornelius, I'd like to uh, maybe give you a couple more, three more, uh, try to answer three more questions and be very quick on that. Um, the one question we've heard in, in our recent surveys is, are these mostly national plans enough to tackle the global challenges? Uh, I think the second question is what I just mentioned is, what about the long-term plan? If the Vision 2030 is uh, the business plan, because it's, it's probably the time span of the businesses in the room, if 2024 is the action plan, what about the strategic plan? Which we think with most of the transformations, the deep transformations in our uh, industries and in our daily lives go way beyond 2030. And, and the third question is, again, how do you engage society at large and populations at large? Because I don't think we will do the job, any of the Visions 2030 will do the job, if they don't talk to every aspect, every facet, every individual in the population. So the first que uh, question is, are they enough, those national plans, to tackle, to, 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 uh, to get into the challenge of the global transitions? And... Um, very rapidly said, or maybe abruptly said, in Europe, um, France is doing the job, Europe is not. And I think we have a very important milestone on Sunday where uh, a lot of us will vote uh, for a better Europe, a more structured Europe, but also a Europe that is able to complement, as you said, Safa, uh, the uh, efforts of the national and the local communities to do the job vis-a-vis the US and China. That's the global competition we're in. And uh, very frankly said, um, I think we need to step it up in Europe. There is willingness, there is uh, 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 resources, there is no political cohesion right now because after the energy crisis born of the Ukraine uh, war, um, we, we have entered a period of divergence and dispersion within Europe. So we need to get back together and, and, and actually build a more cohesive force to uh, challenge uh, the US, which has a very uh, powerful weapon of attractiveness, which is called the IRA. Simplicity, uh, massive investment at the federal and local levels. Uh, if you didn't know, the US is uh, a very liberal country, not in the French sense, but a very uh, interventionist country to support uh, the diversification. 50, 60, 75% of CapEx are financed very simply, very rapidly in the US. We need to do the job. I know we're trying to do the job in France, but I don't think the dispersion in Europe helps us do the job at the European level. So that is my first challenge and first question. The second question, but what about the longer term plan? I think it's obvious that we need to go way beyond 2030. And I know you all do. And I know you all have the longer term plans uh, that go. And, 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 and again, uh, this is where I think uh, Europe and France uh, try to really accelerate the uh, um, reaching the low carbon economy and the uh, net zero economy that is uh, the, the target set for 2040 and 2050. And I think that needs more, even more effort uh, and a longer term perspective. Uh, I don't want to be too long and I, I know you're anxious to, to get into the discussion. So I want to get to the final point, which to me is the most important. Uh, do these visions 2030 uh, engage society at large? 
So not only us businesses and governments, uh, we have the resources, we have the staff, we have the manpower, uh, we have the global reach, but do they engage the population and the wider society? And I'm not talking about any particular region. It's true in Europe, it's probably true, true in the Gulf countries. Um, the plan, the vision, must have the ability to engage everyone. Uh, not only us, but also the weak links. I, I, I like the expression, the weak links, the vulnerability. The plan is only good if there is no vulnerability in the plan. And the weak links for us is the small business owner, uh, the younger generation, uh, the local mayor, uh, because that's where the most difficulties and the most pressures are. Uh, the small business owner uh, sees only over-regulation and probably accumulation of costs because there are a lot of new regulations applied and accompanying those visions 2030, especially going into a low carbon economy. The mayor wants to shelter his population from sometimes the massive disruption that comes with the JIGA factories, a, an, in, an energy infrastructure project. We see that in many communities, uh, not only in this country. Uh, and, and not to speak about the younger generation who probably would come in this room and say, you know, what about me? What, how does it do the job for me now? Uh, can I act? Can I be a, 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 an agent of change in this Vision 2030? So these collective plans must be compelling enough uh, to uh, emphasize the now and not the later. Uh, if you ask me to lose weight, which I need, uh, in 2030, I may start in 2029. And we all know we need to start in 2024. So we need to emphasize the now. We need to emphasize the concrete actions. I think, as Bruno said very, very uh, astutely, we need to be more positive to talk about the uh, benefits of change because change can be painful in a lot of our businesses, in a lot of our societies, in a lot of our communities. So we need to emphasize the uh, uh, incentive to act and not the punishment of inaction. Thank you. If, thank you so much. If I can just, uh, I promise I won't talk much. Very quickly, if I can just comment on what uh, my colleague, Mr. Mark, just mentioned. Um, you know, your question was, how do you distinguish yourself? Um, uh, if you look into what were the main drivers of growth, right? Anywhere, I'm not talking about Bahrain now, I'm talking about anywhere. So there are a few factors uh, that actually drives the growth. And you're talking about sound policies supported by the right regulations um, um, and, and, and having the right infrastructure and supported by having you know, a, a quick, rapid decision-making process. And no one can argue on that. But who is driving that? It is our youth population. And I'm talking collectively, we have around 60 million you know, young population who is very ambitious, who is very driven, um, who love to innovate, who love to, um, you know, uh, who love to invest in startups. And we have amazing companies because of that. Actually, a youth population, if you give them a target, they will not achieve your target. They will overachieve your target. And this is something that we've seen in Bahrain. You know, we've seen in Bahrain where we have companies, we have businesses, startups who are not only national leaders, who are not regional leaders anymore. They are now, you know, uh, they are global leaders. They are becoming magnets to attract FDIs to the country. They are, they, are, they are magnets to attract more investments into the country. So Mark gave me that idea that truly our human capital is what distinguishes us. Our human capital is the new oil. So, uh, so I think whatever efforts, and, and we have very good examples in Bahrain where, you know, we have Citibank, one of the largest institutions in the world, financial institution in the world, who decided to have their global hub, you know, based in Bahrain because of the human capital and the jurisdictions. And we have Mondelez, for example, another American, very well-known, you know, company that does confectionery biscuits, who actually also had their, you know, um, um, one of their six uh, manufacturing hubs in Bahrain. And we have a web, uh, Amazon Web Services, who also are based in Bahrain, and they hosted their first hyperscale data center in Bahrain because of the quality of the human, you know, human capital. So these are our new oil. And when we invested in our human resources, which are our real main assets, we saw a growth. And as a matter of fact, all the five priority sectors of our government, you know, have recorded um, a, a growth even higher than the pre-corona level. So um, I would definitely say that it's, you know, the new oil is our human capital.
No, thank you so much uh, for mentioning this. And actually, uh, this week we are publishing a new report. It's, a, it's called uh, The Green Revolution. It's about uh, job creation capacity building in all the sectors uh, along emission-free technologies. And that's uh, at the heart of our work as a think tank as well, to look at um, the potential to create jobs beyond uh, oil and gas. Uh, a few years back, we looked at uh, how many jobs can be uh, created in the hydrogen um, economy um, in just three GCC countries, being Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Oman. And we found uh, up to one million. And that's obviously a big challenge, because oil and gas is in inevitable decline. Uh, we know that GCC has the lowest marginal cost of production. So the GCC will obviously be the last man standing, remain. But it is clear that uh, the, the overall demand will go down. So, um, And this combined with uh, an extremely favorable demography, with uh, a huge, young, uh, motivated population, many young, bright people, I think this is really uh, the opportunity in the region for all of us to, to really understand. So um, in this sense, uh, thank you so much for mentioning this, Safa. That's much appreciated. And I think Mark uh, was also elaborating uh, quite eloquently and bringing in additional important factors uh, beyond just my core question on um, the visions uh, the Africa see and how uh, you can stand out. So really, thank you so much. Uh, uh, that is great. Um, well, I'm personally... I'm a big fan of Europe. I think Europe, um, even though many challenges are here since uh, the 90s and with common currency, I think there is, uh, there's really amazing achievements. Uh, when in some countries, like my country, Germany, um, it, it's a bit of a challenging period on the leadership side. I'm glad France is stepping in as well. And uh, such a forum here, or I remember the many wonderful events at Expo Dubai, for example, that was really impressive. So big uh, kudos to um, all uh, the wonderful team uh, from France. But what I would like to discuss a bit is on um, integration on the potential potential of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Well, there has been talks on a common currency, for example. Um, the, the, the different currencies are obviously packed to the dollar, um, as we know. But uh, there has been relatively little integration. There's a GCC power grid uh, linking this, uh, the GCC countries. Uh, there's a GCC interconnection authority, uh, which, uh, which we are working together as well. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim is, is one of our board members. Um, but um, I think we discussed this, uh, Suleiman, in the, in the morning. Um, I found it really interesting. You mentioned that, uh, well, none of the potential has been realized, basically. And if we can achieve more integration similar to what Europe has achieved, this is a huge upside for the region. So I'd love to hear uh, your viewpoint on that. Sure. Um I think let's start with, uh, and I don't want to sound any economy, any economist here, but but usually, you know, as my colleagues men, men mentioned, that long plan works. You know, we have seen it, and it's always pay off very well if we have a long term plan. But we, if we look to the normal economy, we have, you know, the basic of supply demand, the basic of uh, global baskets of opportunities and limited resources theories. And if we look to the Middle East, you know, despite the efforts that are happening on the Gulf, and, you know, I, I recognized what Safa has mentioned of the improvement of multiply uh, in the combined GDP of the Gulf, but we still the least integrated region. We still have the Far East, North America, and Europe is far more integrated than uh, the Middle East. And we are seeing that with the talents, with moving from resource-based economy to a uh, knowledge economy, utilizing the different uh, values that are uh, available in the region, our participation to the global economy will increase three or four times at least. This is with very conservative approach. And this is what I think we should, as a Gulf region champion, to help out the whole region to get 
uh, integrated, to be the center of gravity for uh, supply chain resilience, logistics. We have uh, Mohandas uh, Amr Hariri uh, hitting the ports of Saudi where, you know, Red Sea and Gulf, all opportunity to connect the three continents and make the Middle East more integrated. We have the opportunity of having a center manufacturing where we have some pieces manufactured in Egypt and some in Iraq and some in Bahrain and some in Saudi and we collectively have this advanced product that increase the, uh, the humanity uh, uh, development. That's, that's what we are aiming to and regardless of uh, how many effort we are doing in the Gulf, we need as I said, we need six Bahrain and seven Emirates and ten Saudis for us just to compete uh, in in developing this global economy to the uh, potential that it has. Uh, I think we can have a more contribution to uh, to the economy, uh, to the global economy, to the humanity today with 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 AI. You know, that's just. Uh, regardless if you are following the BWC numbers or the EY numbers or McKinsey numbers, but it's very between $5 trillion to $16 trillion in 2030, just the AI contribution on the sectors. That's, that's an, we need everyone to leave their work and just work in AI to contribute in that. So the opportunity is huge. Uh, uh, we have a great talent, 60% of Saudi is youth, uh, same in Gulf, we have huge ambition for our youth, they are looking differently to the world the same way we look, they have, you know, uh, the entrepreneurship, uh, it's in their DNA, uh, they are digitally savvy, they can, they can contribute in developing digital much faster than the older generations. Uh, we have less developed country that require our attention and support. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, thinking that we should not all uh, just focus on how to make our developed countries more developed and look out to the regions where there is a less developing country that need some basic support of infrastructure, basic support of connectivity, basic support of living requirements that we can collectively contribute. That's why what we are seeing of economy, that there are a lot to, to, uh, to produce, a lot to uh, uh, contribute, whether to, uh, to the global economy in general, or uh, specifically to uh, where the gaps and less developing country needs to make sure that we all, as a humanity, achieve our targets. Yeah, thank you for that. Hopefully, we can uh, travel like we can in Europe, maybe in the, in the 30s. You, you just go uh, by car to Oman. I, uh, I go uh, quite often, and unfortunately, you still lose a lot of time at the border. There are many different, uh, well, you can travel uh, by car from, uh, from Abu Dhabi, for example, to Riyadh as well. It's not a problem. So hopefully, we will have open borders. Hopefully, we will have infrastructures linking. There is a big... Um, um, trends, uh, for example, um, a train, there's already goods train between the Emirates, uh, there is a train from Abu Dhabi to Soha planned uh, in Oman on the Indian Ocean, there's passenger trains planned, I think that's a similar uh, kind of trend in Saudi to develop um, infrastructure uh, in such a way. But maybe um, any other comments on um, how Europe integrated, how the GCC can integrate, um, how we can maybe work together in, in such a way, maybe Bruno? Well, as I said uh, before, uh, one thing that we share is this uh, optimistic view of Vision 2030. And we have to keep this in mind, because when you talk about young generation, when we talk about uh, what can we do to improve uh, uh, the quality of life at the end of the day, which is exactly what, what it is a baseline of, uh, of France 2030. Um, uh, better understanding, better production, better life, finally. Uh, I think that um, we need to, to adopt the idea that uh, this green revolution, as I called it, uh, is going to build new links and new alliances around the world. And the business alliances are the ones that can create immediate uh, impact. So that's why it's so important to have those kind of gatherings. So I believe that 
of course, we have a long-term goal, and I completely agree that we have a long-term goal, but it's like sailing. You may have a, we, you may have a target, but sometimes the wind doesn't go right, and the currents uh, are blocking you, so you have to be smart in the way you move, and those ways are really all those little business decisions that you can make down the road. I think that master plans, yes, I'm, I'm totally in favor of it. At the same time, the doer uh, have to work with, with, with the thinker, with the people you know, dreaming of, of 2071, as you said before. So for me, it's a wheel. It's, there is, uh, when, when I visited uh, the kingdom last, uh, two months ago, I really realized concretely, that's why I'm encouraging, stage one is go there. And, and Im increase the number. I know that we have an issue with the planes today, with carbon consumption and so on, but at the end of the day, we'll find ways to have electric planes. We'll find ways to have hydrogen-based planes. So don't stop traveling. That's what I call, I would say, the opposite of, of innovation. So we have to go there. It will be hard. Sometimes there will be disappointment. Uh, there will be back and forth, but at the end of the day, we have to push people to create those new alliances by seeing. Because, of course, when we see those wonderful displays uh, of, of, of Neom or Red Sea of Alula, we're like, wow, this is so cool, but is it real? Well, when you go there, you see it's real. And the people visiting are welcome. And so you can create these connections. And as I said, with Business France and Laurent is here with me, we decided to offer to the French companies, which are uh, part of the French 2030 team, uh, tremendous, you know, money incentive to really fly over, visit, establish. So I think that everything starts by being very concrete. Uh, it's okay, we have a will. I don't think that this, this room is proving that the will exists. We have a will for, for, you know, the Gulf and Europe connection. Now it has to be improved because you talked about AI. Here is my concern about AI. 80%, if not 85%, of AI training in the world today is American, English-based, or Chinese-based, 80 to 85%. Which means at the end of the day, if we augment our intelligence thanks to AI, how do we respect our cultures? So it has to be a, a Gulf AI-based, a French AI-based, a European AI-based. So what I mean is we need to really collaborate to make sure that those new alliances are not just uh, are redefining the rules of the world for the future and not just base our, our, our projection of the future on different cultures than ours. That's what I really believe in. That's why I, I believe culture specifically has to be nurtured by those traveling as well. As, as Mr. Le Drian said, uh, Alula is not by chance that we're interested in, in Alula, it's because those millenniums cultures have to talk together, and, and I believe that that's why Europe and the Gulf has a, has a very good connection for the time to come. Yeah, I think uh, you're completely right, and that's what we heard at COP28 as well. We need really an unprecedented level of collaboration, of cooperation, of the alliances, as you rightly say, Bruno. I think that's a super important point as well. I, uh, I see that we soon need to uh, wrap up the panel, but I, I saw Mark, you would like to comment as well? No, I'd, I'd like to be, um, because EY likes to answer questions, I'd like to answer your question, do we need more regional integration? I, I, I think certainly that's what we've heard in the Gulf from businesses. Uh, and I think the way you, uh, uh, Suleiman, put it is, is the right way. Um, concrete projects uh, that, that the people can see, as, as Safa said. In Europe, it's, it's an emergency. Currently, France has the, a very good moment in terms of its economic traction, its visibility in the world, uh, the number one destination for foreign investment. It's an enormous achievement, and I said what I think the France 2030, how the France 2030 plan contributed to that. But, and, and we can rejoice for a few seconds very discreetly that uh, our British competitors are not in the right moment because of Brexit. We can rejoice for a few seconds that Germany is uh, currently in a, in a bit of a pickle because of the energy transition and because of maybe a political uh, vision that is not as clear as it was before. But I think it's a very short-term uh, joy. Uh, the long-term uh, plan and the long-term force of Europe for more 
French and European exporters to the Gulf, for large companies able to uh, embrace the complexities and the risk of AI, as you said very rightfully. Need, we need Europe. We need more integration. We absolutely need Europe beyond the Green Deal, beyond the digital agenda. Uh, we need a vision and we need a plan. And I think, uh, again, uh, a big encouragement to vote for whoever you vote, because I think the uh, uh, Sunday's elections are absolutely critical in that next step of our integration in Europe. Yeah, it's a duty, of course. That's a duty in democracy to vote. Uh, Suleiman, please. Uh, I, I think we heard a lot of encouragement to visit uh, Saudi from uh, my colleague, uh, but it's 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 my role actually to invite the business to to Saudi. We we had the best you know uh, two years, more than 20 symposium, France Saudi symposium for specific sectors. But to be honest, uh, the sectors that we are working on will not happen by exchanging cards. It requires long-term trust build, and that requires many of online meetings uh, uh, and physical meetings to establish this long-term partnership. So I really encourage uh, people to come to Saudi, uh, meet our uh, their their future partners to build this long relation of Saudi-French uh, uh, relation. We will be uh, working with uh, uh, Business France, uh, France 2030, to make sure we make this an enjoyable trip, a uh, fruitful trip. You will get all the details required for you to make your next move in Saudi. Uh, and hopefully, we will have more hands uh, next time we, I came last year, we had less, time, less hands this year, we have, I have seen more hands. Uh, and by the way, they are the same hands for Bahrain. So I, I count them. <laughs> so we need more people to come to Saudi, to Bahrain, to the Gulf, and participate uh, on this uh, Vision 2030. And, and, and if I can just add, uh, it's true. Seeing is believing. So yeah. again, I would like to, you know, just have my voice integrated with my colleagues, you know, uh, and have an open invitation for you to visit Bahrain. Trust me, we won't talk about work. It's going to be a very enjoyable trip. And, and I, I promise you from this platform that give me a KPI. Okay, and, and we'll make sure that we not only achieve it, but we overachieve it. And trust me, there's not going to be any regrets. So looking forward Super. to having you all in Bahrain. Uh, thank you so much for such an energetic, inspiring panel. That was really wonderful and I think a great way to kick off the day. Please join me in applauding. Thank you.